had several meaningful exchanges and professional experience sharing with Okay. We now move on to a relevant issue, taking a holistic view of the private sector in Egypt, and there is no disagreement about how crucial this is for any possible economic reform. Our next session titled, What are the expansion prospects for the private sector? would look into what are the impediments and enablers, the challenges and the opportunities. I invite on the stage Mr. Meghet Aizeddin, country senior partner of PwC Egypt. <laughs> Mr. Aizeddin has been with PwC for almost 30 years and was responsible for developing the firm's vision and long-term market strategies in Egypt. Throughout his career, he advised many clients on their market entry, investment strategies, and specific transactions. Mr. Aizeddin will also be moderating this session. I next invite Ms. Yasmin Elhini, act, Acting Country Manager of the International Finance Corporation of e for Egypt, to join us on stage. <clears throat> Ms. Elhini is also a school alumna and she has assumed various responsibilities throughout her career, including ex executing strategic investments, building partnerships, and leading transformation projects. I also call upon Mr. Khaled El Mikati, Chairman of the Board at Mikati Investment and Trading Company, MITCO, to join our esteemed panel. <clears throat> Mr. Mikati is an engineer who is founder and board member of several companies working in building materials, logistics, exports and imports, working across several uh, countries, including some countries in Africa. Mr. Mekati was also the former Secretary General of the Egyptian National Competitive Council from 2011 to 2014. Last but not least, also joining this panel, Mr. Sam Hassan, another alumnus of the AUC School of Business and the Chief Executive Officer of Savola Foods Company. Mr. Hassan, please join us on stage. Mr. Hassan uh, accumulates more than 35 years of experience in multinational and regional companies in the Middle East, Africa, and Europe. He co this is coupled also with board memberships that have spanned uh, companies from FMG, FMCGs, food services, electronics distribution, and other fields. I'm sure that this will be another interesting discussion from key, key players in the private sector. Thank you, Dr. Wafa. I heard about the light, but I didn't expect it to be that strong. <laughs> but anyways, uh, I can still see uh, we are the last panel. I was expecting us to be talking to ourselves, but I can still see a good turnaround. So thank you for uh, hanging on, and hopefully you'll find it uh, interesting. So without any further ado, let's get into the topic. The topic, as uh, Dr. Wafa mentioned, uh, talks about the pres uh, prospects of the private sector. Um, and I'm sure a lot of you have heard over and over again that there is, you know, low level of par uh, participation of the private sector, whether it's 25 or 26 percent, and that we wanted and we're hoping to have a 65 percent. We also saw the decline in the purchasing manager index, PMI, which is a good indicator and it shows that private sector is uh, declining. So why? Is it external? Is it internal? What, what is the cause? I mean, we know that there are external ch challenges and they're global, like, uh, for example, the pandemic uh, did disturb the supply chain. That happened. Uh, also, the Russia-Ukraine war and its implication, the um, global inflation, also uh, from internal, there are other uh, challenges like the declining foreign reserve. I mean, private sector wants to import uh, raw material for the production, for example, or if they're trading. And then there is the LC challenge, which is now removed. And there is, they want the foreign currency, don't find the foreign currency. And being a professional service advisor, I'm blessed to talk to the private sector and also the state or the government. Or, um, so you talk to stakeholders and you get to 
understand and analyze what's the, what's the issue because everyone is looking for the others and blaming them so private sector is saying you know this is not a level playing field and there is crowding out for us and it's hard to do business how can we compete we pay we pay value for the land we pay taxes and customs others don't you look at the state uh, wider uh, description of the state and they would say okay we all know that capital is covered and during the events that happened private sector did not you know play its role so the government or the state has to step in and um, you know to employ people and have infrastructure projects and all what we've seen we'll try and discuss with the uh, panelists the topic of the prospect of the private sector but before i do that if you allow me less than a minute uh, the topic before me was uh, family business and family business is also private sector right and they are as we heard they contribute to gdp and they're important um uh, I'm not a history teacher, but family business had a reset, I think, in the 50s with Nasser era. So we started counting generation after that. And, um, you know, we don't have, I, I think maximum you, you see third generation if you're lucky. Um, some people say, you know, the first generation is entrepreneurs. Second generation is caretakers. What is third generation? <laughs> Some, some people refer to them as undertakers. And whether business managed to survive beyond the third generation, that's an interesting part. So we do surveys as a, as a professional service advisor. And we did one about family business. We had less than 50, actually it's 47 families that contributed to last year's survey. And we come, came up with, um, with a conclusion, which is, um, Family business need to get serious about institutionalization. I'm glad I'm, I was able to un pronounce it. It's not about, you know, um, you have the same DNA, so you work in the family, whether you got it or not, or you marry into the family. Uh, so it needs to be institutionalized, meaning corporate governance, uh, having clear succession plans and you know welcoming uh, management talented management to the firm can i start with you <laughs> Khaled? <laughs> so the first question goes to uh, mr khalid al mikati is the mic working so ali udemus I'll ask you the question while you're fixing. Uh, you do have vast experience across various sectors like logistics, building materials and chemicals and in inputs and exports. What are the issues your company faces doing business in Egypt? And on the positive side, and you have a positive flip, what has been improved or started to work better? Uh, first of all, thank you for having me on the panel. But before going to the positive side, let us talk about the reality side. Uh, any industry currently in Egypt, basically in our sector, the building material, will not grow with a uh, black market existence. I mean, uh, uh, with something that we don't know what's happening in the next year or in the next week. Uh, we hear about another floating, and like Dr. Ahmed saying, we are floating and floating and floating, and that's an unstoppable issue. When you float, you float once. So, uh, for us to plan what we're going to do in our increasing in exports, because in our industry we have to bring in some raw material, we have to bring in some consumables. So again, we are facing the issue of the availability of the currency, and there is no currency. Uh, even in the black market, there is no currency. And unless the government has a proper uh, monetary policy, uh, it's not going to be solved. I mean, uh, when will they be able to overcome the traders of the currency? I mean, we know the traders are based in the Gulf. They're not in Egypt. 
and they are monitoring the, the currency from over there. So unless we bypass this, and we have to be frank with ourselves, we cannot just talk behind doors, and we have to be very transparent. And when you're being transparent, then you would know and how to solve the problem. So uh, I'm not saying it's a very negative or a black direction. There is always uh, a positive direction, and there will always be an opportunity in some industries, because in any crisis, there is an opportunity. So we are developing another opportunity in another business in the building material. But for example, as in the last panels, we're, we were talking about how are we attracting FDIs. In one of the industries we're working in, which is in the wood sector, uh, we went to approach to an Italian manufacturer, one of the largest manufacturers in Italy and in Europe. And they are facing the increase of price of gas and everything. It went six times in the last year. But he said he doesn't want to come to Egypt. He would go to Turkey, but not come to Egypt. Because there's instability in monetary policies, in the physical policies, they don't know, in the license, in any impediment that the government might put as a fees that are unknown to them. Uh, so why would we come here? Turkey is now, we were talking about Turkey in the previous uh, panels, Turkey is becoming the hub of industry in the Mediterranean. It's going to replace a lot of industries from China are going to be in Turkey. They have the innovation, they have the know-how, they have the raw material, and they have the market. And they have a stable policy. In spite that they have a huge depreciation in their currency, but yet they increased their exports, they attracted more uh, tourists, and we didn't do either one of them. So unless we have a proper, transparent policy, the private sector that is aware of, we can't even export. I mean, we are exporting to 16 different countries, to Europe, to the States, to the Asian part, a little bit to the African market, very little to the African market, unfortunately, which we need to increase. But now we went down to nine countries because course of the challenges that are happening in Europe. Uh, the cost of logistics has tremendously increased because of what's happening. So we can't reach the markets that are far away. And even the cost of logistics to Africa has went two and a half times. So again, these are all major challenges that we are unable to overcome, even if the government is giving you incentives for the uh, for the logistics, it's not enough. Incentives is not a solution. Incentives, when it was there, it was initiated to let you penetrate the market that you're unable to penetrate until you prove yourself and then khalas, you don't need any more incentives because you developed the need. So it's not a continuous process to continue to have incentives. It is how to penetrate the market, how the government will help you to penetrate this market and are they going to continue to compete with you in the industries or not? Because in our industry, the government is competing with us, and we have to be, again, transparent. So if you're competing with us, how can we sustain? Because everything they're getting is as much as less than 50% of what we are enduring. So on the positive side, there's other industries within the building material, building material sector that we can work on because most of the raw material is locally based and we can direct it to the new emerging markets. Saudi Arabia is an emerging market. Okay? But what again the government is doing? I mean, we had a market in Iraq where we were reaching with a client to around 50 containers a month. The government, one of the companies came in, they took the order and then they could not sustain it because they could not sustain the quality that the client wants. And when the client refused to continue with the government, they threatened him that you will not enter in Egypt. So what is this? So I'm sorry to be frank, but if we're not transparent enough, we're not going to bypass our challenges. Thank you. I want to find out what I I agree with most of what you said. And... Um, the stability uh, is quite important. So um, I do business plans. 
and business plans normally is around five years period where you have the main assumptions and and then you plan uh, whether you gonna enter the market or expand is it a new production line or whatever and um, I don't remember any of those business plans really after five years met the expectations because uh, maybe after five months the laws will change not five years so I agree with you we need stability thank you um, can I move to you Samah same question um, what are the challenges of doing business in Egypt and what has improved um. I'd like to, to tackle um, um, a slightly different angle uh, to, to that topic. Um, in our business, we're privileged to be operating across multiple countries. And um, it, it, it simply becomes a benchmarking exercise of what we see in one country versus the other one. Um, so you compare the number of um, challenges that you have in one market and uh, you, you benchmark against uh, Egypt or against other markets uh, to see where you would like to allocate your resources. Uh, and if I take this, um, this point in time uh, and um, look at, let's say, one extreme, um, uh, the UAE, uh, where you look and you have some inflation, um, you have uh, increasing cost of financing to some extent. And um, that's it, really. These are the challenges that you face in, in, in a country or economy like the UAE. Uh, you go to Morocco, for example, uh, you get, again, some inflation, uh, some government regulations that are uh, slightly challenging, uh, at least in our sector. Uh, but you come to Egypt and you have a long list of, um, of challenges that um, you're dealing with. Uh, uh, number one, um, y you look at inflation, obviously. Uh, you look at uh, cost of financing uh, uh, and n not just the, the immediate reflection of um, increase in interest rates, uh, but, and all for good reasons, y you, you get initiatives that were supporting industrial companies withdrawn uh, overnight, which uh, overnight, which doubles the, the cost of financing uh, to uh, to the private sector companies, uh, with no dialogue, no nothing. Th this is all uh, a result of a government um, um, agreement with the IMF uh, that the private sector has to uh, comply with um, uh, w without any consultation. Although everybody in the previous panels w was talking about having this dialogue and, and making sure that uh, um, we listen to the private sector. Um, on top of uh, those reasons, you, you have uh, forex issues, which we're, we're all um, aware of. And then you have the, 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 the cancerous element, which is uh, decisions that come every day, not necessarily at the ministerial level, but at the sub-ministerial level. And you get decisions, you get levies, you get uh, uh, impositions uh, on the private sector. Uh, and, and there's very little coordination, obviously, between the different uh, government agencies that do that. So you get something from the Ministry of Health, you get something from the Ministry of Labor, uh, and each ministry has its own reasons why they're imposing that kind of restriction on the private sector, but no, no, no uh, coordination whatsoever, and everything ends up on, in the lap of the private sector. And then we ask, why is the private sector not competitive? Uh, I can give you 200 reasons why the private sector is, uh, is, is, not, uh, is not competitive with other, uh, with other markets. So uh, if, if I want to put uh, just a title to that, it's the unpredictability of the economic environment. Every day you have uh, a new variable being added to your um, decision-making process uh, that you didn't know about and you didn't expect and you're expected to comply and as good corporate citizens I think majority of the companies uh, will comply but at the expense of competitiveness and that simply leads to uh, a decision at the board room level where we sit in Saudi um, allocation of resources goes somewhere else as simple as that fish light at the end of the tunnel it's always light, <laughs> always light. Uh, we'll talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you mentioned the silos uh, phenomena of the, um, the line ministries which is uh, which is something uh, yeah, and inshallah will be overcome uh, hopefully in the near future 
uh, I guess uh, yeah I do agree with you and uh, I'll move to Yasmin Yasmin you're now representing IFC IFC published a very comprehensive private sector uh, diagnostic country report for Egypt around two years ago I lost it if you can resend it that would be fantastic going back to the structural issues analyzed in this report which uh, do see being currently addressed by government policy and direction and which are yet to be tackled. And thank you for the invitation and I really appreciate the the frank and constructive discussion that we've had throughout the day and I'll try to follow the same spirit. So um, as Megan mentioned, IFC published a report, IFC with the World Bank published a report two years ago called the Country Private Sector Diagnostic. This is a report that we do across all markets globally and the objective is basically to identify what are the opportunities for the private sector, what are the constraints that are cross-cutting and what are some of the specific sectors where there are opportunities and what are the bottlenecks um, related to those specific sectors? So for Egypt, um, I'll mention the three main cross-cutting challenges. I don't think anyone in the room would be surprised to hear what they were. Um, the first one was related to barriers to trade, and this has been discussed extensively. And this relates both to tariff and non-tariff barriers, but also on the port and logistics infrastructure that governs the trade activity as well. So that was the first one. Um, the second one is related to the rule of law, so enforceability of uh, commercial contracts, the amount of time it takes to actually get decisions, and this is something that we've known over the past decades, actually in Egypt has been a challenge. The third we talk a lot about, which is the role of the state, and um, the, the main elements that were discussed in the report were around transparency, and this is something that we've heard today. So. In any country, the state has a role, whether it's as a regulator or having um, a stake in some economic activities. I think the question that the private sector often has is, what is the strategy for state ownership? So where, does this, where is the state in? Where is the state out? And what is the predictability over the coming years in terms of where the state is going to play a role? Um, on what has been done, I'll start with the latter, because I do think that the, the state ownership policy that was released a few months ago was a very positive step. It addressed the transparency issue. It started a dialogue with the private sector on what was going to happen. I remember we had a private sector roundtable that was pre-planned that happened to coincide two weeks after the launch. And we came into the roundtable actually very optimistic because it was exactly in line with what the CPSD and our recommendations had been uh, talking about and we wanted to hear from the private sector. And I have to say that I was a bit taken aback by what we heard and, and this is something that Dr. Ali alluded to is you need to listen to the people on the ground. So I think almost 100% of the people in the room believed that it was a positive step. Um, there were some people, uh, some private sector leaders that believed that there is a risk that the government would go back on the state ownership policy should global conditions improve and fiscal constraints be removed. So that was something, this is related to the trust that you mentioned, Meg, it is, what is the trust between the two? Uh, um, I think it's improving, but it needs a bit more work. But 100% of the participants, and this is something I firmly believed in, said it's all about the implementation. It's great to have a policy, but we've been talking about the same issues for decades. And I remember a few years ago, I heard, um, in a session by um, uh, an ex-Malaysian government official, the experience of what Malaysia did setting up an entity called Pemandu. Pemandu, it's a, it's a Malaysian word for guide, and it's basically performance management and delivery. They had a national strategy, but they knew that there were these silos and they needed to deliver and they were under pressure. So they set up this entity at a central level reporting to the prime minister. They hired a third from the private sector, a third from the civil service, and a third from the state ownership, um, uh, state-owned entities, and they just relentlessly pursued the execution for years until they, re they reached their objectives. So I think there have been some um, measures that have been implemented, like a state ownership policy. I would say the government is pursuing port infrastructure quite significantly, including through bringing in private sector, and we're uh, looking forward to supporting some of those. 
Um, commercial law and enforcement, I think, is an area that still needs a lot of work. Um, on some of the sectoral elements, I think there has been some progress. Healthcare is an area where there's been a lot of business activity, but quite cumbersome regulations. I know that the government now is looking to remove some of those bottlenecks and streamline M&A. So there have been some bright spots. Given where the country is now, I think really a central unit that is very clear on its strategy, working with the different government entities to implement, is what's going to take Egypt to the next level. Excellent answer, Yasmin. Thank you very much. Um, the challenges are known, as you said, and uh, needs to be tackled. Um, the low thing uh, will, will take some time, and I guess uh, as a, as a short-term solution, people take to arbitration or Sikhsika or whatever. You mentioned the state ownership policy document. Uh, it's an interesting read, and I discussed it in uh, full in my capacity in the Egyptian Business Association. It's a step in the right direction, I would say, but needs a, a lot of work and how do we calculate the percentage and what's the definition, what's the state, how do you define it, and, and things like that. You mentioned something that is close to my heart, which I didn't expect you to, to mention. You talked about Malaysia and Pimandu. So I, I, I got the Pimandu people, I talked to PwC, and I told them there is Pimandu, there is also Saudi has done something called ADA, which is based on Pimandu of Malaysia, and I wanted to do this in Egypt. And I wanted to fund it from the World Bank, which is uh, the father of IFC. <laughs> so maybe we can take it offline, because I've been trying to do this for years, and the, the country got excited about that. They wanted to do this KPI thing which the digital transformation and everything, so maybe we can uh, do something about it. Back to Khaled. <laughs> Earlier in the event, the issue of devaluation, which is the elephant in the room, and how it can potentially lead to build Egypt export potential was discussed. What is your take um, on that from your on-ground experience as an industry leader and a former chamber of the Egyptian Export Association? I didn't know that, but you also have experience doing business with various African countries, as you've mentioned. You wanted to do more, inshallah. So I would like to hear your reflection on how, um, in the current situation, could exporting business be enabled? And of course, it could be a natural hedge, right? Okay, so we're not discussing devaluation again, because we've discussed it before. So, uh, opportunities in Africa, yes, there's an immense opportunities in Africa, uh, either east or west. Forget the south now, because it's a little bit challenging. Uh, but you need to know how to do business uh, in Africa, because most of the exporters are working in Europe, or in the Gulf, or in the uh, States. But it's completely different when you come to do business in Africa. And uh, the Africans always have to see it's a win-win relationship. You cannot go there only to take their money and make m yourself more profitable and win and leave them and go. Uh, it, it doesn't work. And it has to also come closer in a relationship. You have to build the relationship with the Africans. So uh, it is a mutual uh, cooperation together. And in Egypt, I mean, of course, the, the processed food is a huge market. I mean, especially in oil and all that, cooking oil. Egypt is one of the largest exporters to, to East Africa, especially. Uh, processed food like pasta. We are the largest exporters of pasta, more than the Italians, to, to Egypt, to, to Africa, East and West Coast. Uh, but we need to do more. I mean, we need to go and do um, assembling. I mean, we have the engineering sector. Uh, some of them have went out. They were doing an assembly unit in Burundi. There's another one in Rwanda. There's one in Algeria. But we need to do more. And we can do assembling using our own brand name. We don't need to do white labeling. So it gives more credibility to our product and it in also gives more uh, I mean, um, rewardness to the brand, to the Egyptian brand. Uh, so engineering sector is very profitable. I mean, we see home appliances, we see uh, electrical meters, 
the, the uh, water meters that are being assembled now there in West Africa. Uh, we are seeing also um, the people doing in TVs, they're doing assembling of TVs coming out of an Egyptian market. Uh, so this is what we need to see and it goes on an assembling part. But uh, even if you go and do, for example, an aluminium workshop, there's no aluminium workshops there and they need. And we have an extrusion of aluminium, so we can send the profiles and we can do a workshop there. That's also very much highly required and is very much profitable. And there's no more the Chinese preferential that is there in Africa. The Africans, as it has been said in the, by Dr. Ahmed, they like the Egyptians. They want to work with the Egyptians. Uh, and they want to be like a, a joint cooperation together. We cherish together. I just had a, a deal made for the Arab contractors with one of the African, countries, African companies in, in Kenya. They were be at the beginning talking to a Chinese company, but then they moved to the Arab contractors. Uh, can I say the names? Yes, of course. Yeah. There's no problem. Man. So they moved to the Arab contractors, and the finance was coming from the uh, UK government. So it's how to bend, blend the finance with business cooperation. And they're doing 150 kilometers road in Kenya. So it would be awarded to the uh, Egyptian company over crossing a Chinese company. Even if the Chinese was coming with the finance, but the preferential because of the UK finance, they preferred to have an Egyptian company. So there is the opportunities. Also, we're doing another uh, business transaction with the Moroccans. So that's to take the Egyptian furniture from here, going to the Moroccan side, have it an added value done over there and re-export to West Africa as if it's in a Moroccan uh, product because we don't have agreement with the ICWAS yet. Uh, so un until the uh, African free trade agreement is in imposed on all the African countries. So that's another opportunity for the furniture sector to export to Morocco and from Morocco go down to the uh, West Africa. So there is a lot of opportunities, but you have to cooperate. You have to make partnership. You cannot just go and sell and, uh, and think that you're going to succeed. It's completely different. More or less also or, or above, you have to have present on the ground. So that means if you're going to do home appliances, you have to have after-sales service. You just can't go and sell. If you want to do uh, processed food or if you want to do FMG products, you have to have a warehouse there. So we have a wholesale uh, team. You sell because if you want to sell to Carrefour, it's 45 days. They will not import. They want product there in the warehouse. So again, it's doing business in Africa because you need to know what opportunity is there. Your product is appreciated. Your agricultural products, we're exporting oranges now to Kenya. We were only exporting to the Europe market, to the Asian market, to the Russian market. Now we're exporting to Kenya oranges. Pomegranate, we are exporting. So there's a, also agricultural products that are growing towards Africa. So this is important to go to Africa, but learn how to do the business there. There's a lot of money. There's so many financial institutions there's the African Development Bank, there's the African Export Exim Bank, there is Badia Bank, there is the ITFC. They're all directed funds towards the African uh, continent, beside the European funds. So it's there. Just go and knock doors and work. Thank you very much. And I'm, uh, I'm actually too excited about the concept of uh, looking uh, to uh, trade with Africa. And I think now is the time, given the recent uh, Continental Africa Trade Agreement, I think uh, exporting with Europe or the West is nice to have, but uh, I remember in one of the previous uh, uh, panels they mentioned it's not easy, the margins are slim, and instead of looking up to uh, export to Europe, and you end up giving them strawberry and oranges, I'm not saying that's bad, and then take everything from them. I think the, the balance of trade with Africa would make more sense. A few years uh, back, I uh, met a UK minister, and when she introduced herself, she said, I'm the UK minister of Africa. I said, oh my God, why don't we have a minister for Africa? Since the focus is on Africa, we need to have a minister, Intel minister of Africa, 
Can I? No, I need to add something. I mean, one of the things that is uh, uh, increasing the exports of Morocco, for example, to West Africa and dominating West Africa is because their banking system. They have their banks in 12 Western African countries. We only have one bank, which is the CIB, in, in Kenya, Mayfair Bank. We have another bank that is not operating well in Uganda, has been there for ages, but it, yani, it has yani, grow, grown up, so it's becoming very old, so they're not operative. And that's it. The others are correspondents. So unless we have our banking system going out with the exporters, we're not going to be able also to increase our exports. If the African Export Input Bank, but, uh, I agree with you. Um, I think there is a lot uh, need to be done in this African uh, uh, direction and the relationship with Africa should extend beyond the uh, football matches. And um, I was uh, fortunate enough to, to be um, a moderator on the first ever investment promotion agencies of Africa. And as you've uh, rightfully said, we need to know how to deal with them, right? So we need to know how to deal with them, we need to know the culture, and we need to do that. And maybe instead of you know, complaining about crowding out the private sector, maybe we can take the state and or they, the state can take the private sector hand and go to Africa because they know how to do business there. So uh, we're running out of time, so I'll have to be uh, quicker. Uh, speaking of the devaluation, Savola <laughs> Amaliti. Um, which devaluation? Uh, I'm sure your uh, job is interesting uh, in Egypt. Uh, we, we have, we've been operating in Egypt for uh, 20 years. And uh, during uh, those 20 years, we've seen 300%, uh, 400% uh, devaluation, I guess. Uh, so every almost five years, you have a new round of devaluation. And if we're talking about attracting FDI, we have to think like the uh, investors would think. Um, FDI doesn't like that, doesn't like that every five years you reset your financials uh, back to square one. Because obviously any investor who's investing from abroad is not Egyptian pound denominated. They are some other currency de denominated. So you devalue your, um, your, your uh, currency and um, uh, basically, you're telling the investor that you you went back five years in time. So uh, it, it's um, again another cancer. I'm using the the, the, the same uh, the same terminology here. Uh, it's very difficult for any um, investor, FDI um, um, uh, holder who who wants to uh, make a decision on where to invest that money, to come to a market that sets back or resets back their financials every five years. So devaluation is, is ex extremely serious, and um, um, I, I understand what Dr. Uh, Galal was talking about when he said this has to stop. Uh, it cannot be the solution for anything and everything that we refloat our currency. So um, uh, I, I think the, the danger with that as well, is you devalue today, uh, the expectation locally is that you don't increase your prices um, and the expectation internationally is that you Im immediately make up for that difference in, uh, in value in uh, foreign currency. So which one do you follow? Uh, internally, internally locally? locally. <laughs> internally, uh, exactly. locally you're being beaten up by everybody that um, uh, you're taking advantage and you're increasing the price and uh, uh, you're, uh, you're not being fair to the Egyptian market and the Egyptian consumer. And then when you look at um, your reporting back into the original uh, country of the investment, you'll find that you lost 500% of what you delivered last year. Uh, so uh, it's, it's a huge dilemma and, and the solution is clear for investors. If we're talking about listening to investors, uh, for investors there's only one, uh, one measure which is how much am I growing my money in my original currency. 
So if I'm investing in dollars, I want to see my uh, value uh, being uh, grown in, in, uh, in dollars, not in Egyptian pounds. So uh, we, we have to find a solution for, uh, for that. Or you just free up the market totally and expect that you devalue today by 35%. Prices are going to go up tomorrow by 35%. No questions asked. No one should discourage that from happening because if we're talking about a free economy, if we're talking about uh, uh, freedom of, of trade, this is what is expected. This is what international investors expect. That you made the decision, you bear the con consequences. Thank you. So I guess the, the challenge now will be uh, return of money, not return on money. Because you divide by a bigger denominator. So let's say you invested uh, $100 million, you've done an amazing KGAR, everything is going excellent, but you entered at 7 or entered at 17, and then you exit at 27. E exactly. I, I mean, of course, no one wants to neglect the social uh, angle and the social elements and the importance of protection, uh, protection for the most vulnerable consumers. Uh, that, that goes without saying. I, I, I just want us to, to face the, the, the reality of being externally focused, again, not just internally focused. Internally focused uh, will, will force us to, to make a certain set of decisions and put pressure on competitiveness of companies, and the only result is reduced margins. Companies in Egypt, especially uh, um, uh, multinationals are making lesser, uh, lesser and lesser margins every year because you cannot uh, pass on all those impacts of uh, not just devaluation but global inflation of uh, raw materials. Um, uh, you're talking about increasing cost of financing. The, there are multiple reasons and, and Mr. Uh, as al Arab was talking about um, uh, the impact of interest rates impact of interest rates uh, is, is, is straightforward. You have a working capital of 100 million, you finance at 8%, it's different from if you finance at 15%. It's as simple as that. Uh, the, the, the turn, uh, uh, capital turns have almost nothing to do with that, unless you're able to generate massive savings um, that, that will, uh, will enable you to actually be impacted by only a fifth of, uh, of the increase in, in interest rates. So interest rates have a direct impact. Uh, devaluation certainly a, a huge impact. Um, uh, uh, cost of, uh, of doing business in the country, everything is going up. Services are going up. You're, you're getting inflation imported and uh, locally, uh, locally grown. So all that has to be passed on somewhere. And while you pass on to consumers some of it, I can assure you that many of the multinational companies are getting uh, massive pressure on their margins and we are not, uh, um, we, we, we're, uh, we're included in that. Thank you. Yes, me. Uh, regarding the anticipated uh, IPOing of state-owned enterprises and global events of the year having seemingly delayed this step further, and yeah, considering both the timing and the global recession, that could, of course, undermine valuation. Yeah, should we go now or not? As well as the pressing need to take action to improve the investment climate and private sector ecosystem. What would be the advice on this as IFC or as Yasmin, as you like? So I think IPOs are one tool that can be used to bring in private sector investments. And I, and I think it's important to see IPOs in that way because there are multiple ways for you to bring in um, investments. There are cross-cutting variables for all of the ways, but IPOs have an especially tricky element because you're also subject to global market conditions which affect the local stock market. Um, and I think that it's, it's great that the government had taken a, um, steps to say that we would like to deepen our local capital market, and I think they're still committed to that, and now it's being hampered by global, global conditions. So what do you do? One is to look at the other ways. So I think strategic investments are very uh, are a great way to also bring in operational expertise, um, global insights into companies that the government would like to monetize. So this is something that I think is very important to consider. The same for PPPs um, and also other tools such as concession agreements or others. But fundamentally what applies to all of them is 
it's very important to make sure that these companies are really competitive on a global scale. And there are a number of things. One is the, you mentioned is on the governance side. So globally, investors will look at companies that have very solid corporate governance practices or on the road to developing those. Um, the second is on environmental and social risk management. It's something that I know it's relatively nascent in Egypt, but really accelerating. And really the number of investors that you can bring in if you adopt environmental and social risk management just multiplies when you look at what we've seen globally and I'm sure as well, for example, on the government's issuance of the sovereign green bond, this must have been one of the drivers that brought in some of these new investors is looking at the climate angle. Yeah, we just had hosted COP, so ESG is the hot topic now. Yeah, and, and it's really and it makes business and commercial sense. You get and this is one way to uh, cut down on costs. Um, and then just the, the final thing also is on solid financial management, because I think this is something as well in working with, with family businesses and SMEs. This is something that not just in any emerging market, it's important to have very solid financial management practices. And this has a very direct correlation with the valuation. That, so all of these variables will affect and maximize the valuation that the company would get. So when the market conditions are ready, these companies are prepared and you're able to build a story that's compelling to global investors. Thank you very much. I realize we're you know, part of the challenge of being the last panel is that we squeezed on time and people have commitment. So um, let's go for a round of uh, last comment on the topic. And um, if you can limit it to a couple of minutes, that would be fantastic. Yani, I would, you know, I would say things that needs to be done. Uh, that my first part, it's we have to have a proper monetary policy that is clear uh, and transparent to the private sector. We don't want to wake up every morning and find a surprise. They cancelled the eight percent, and now we're facing seventeen percent. Very nice surprise in the morning. We have to have a monetary policy is very transparent, a physical policy. And when you have a monetary policy, you have to show that you have the tools to do the monetary policy or to be able to implement this monetary policy. Because if you don't have the tools or you have a nice monetary policy, then it's useless. Same thing comes to the physical policy. Now, physical policy, this has to be shared with the private sector. I mean, you have done a stimulus package of 400 billion Egyptian pounds, but where did it go? And how was it dispersed in the market? And what came back out of the stimulus package? So that was not even clear or shared with the private sector because the private sector definitely has a lot of experience more than the state, to be frank. So that's another thing. And then we need to see crowding out. And crowding out is not being launched in the IPO or going to the stock market because that's not the return. Crowding out is going into the sovereign fund, bringing in better management to these state-owned companies and then reselling it out of the sovereign fund. That's how it uh, should be done. Uh, that's from my point of view. On the other part, where is the state role in supporting the Egyptian exporters across the globe. What is the state doing when going to Africa? What kind of supports are they providing? What kind of information are they providing us to enlighten uh, our decision? Yes, I'm going to East, I'm going to West. There's the opportunity. What kind of industries are we going to focus on to go abroad? Because not all industries go to the same time, to the same place. Okay, so defining the competitive edge in which industries and where is the opportunity in which country, that's something that should be shared with the state and is not happening. Okay, that's... Um, final remarks. I'd like to make a remark on uh, FDI uh, again. Um, FDI is, um, is, is a critical component to uh, the future uh, uh, of Egypt's economy. Uh, 
as we heard everybody, I think there's consensus uh, to that. So how do we manage uh, to attract and retain uh, FDI? Uh, from our point of view, from private sector point of view, and an FDI uh, player in the country. Uh, number one, you have to make the current investors happy first. And, and it was mentioned before, but make sure that uh, uh, investors talk to each other, especially if we're talking about attracting investment from the uh, closest and easiest source of, um, of FDI for us, which is the Gulf. In the Gulf, it's, it's a very simple process. People talk, companies talk. Before they go and make an investment in uh, com country X, they look for who is actually there, who is on the ground in country X, and they go and ask um, uh, th th that investor how um, they're finding their experience in, in that country. So very important that we make the existing investors uh, uh, happy with reasonable returns on their uh, investments. Uh, point uh, number two, uh, we, we need to plan. It's like anything else. We need to have strategy, structure, and staffing. And strategy, we, we need to decide where to play and how to win. Which regions are we going to get FDI from? And uh, what kind of incentives are we go going to offer those investors to, uh, to get? And then who's going to be uh, responsible for that uh, process? Because today you have the Ministry of uh, Industry and Trade, uh, you have uh, uh, the, the uh, um, councils, the, the uh, export councils and uh, uh, the Ministry of Finance. Uh, you have to decide who's going to do what. And then staffing, you have to throw your best people at that. Because um, we, we've been talking about that several times to um, uh, uh, visits that come to uh, Saudi and the Gulf. We keep telling them that you need to uh, have offices permanently placed in the Gulf. Not a visit for a couple of days and everybody comes back to Egypt and nothing really happens. You need to have offices staffed by bright people who are fully aware of the, the opportunities and they can go and make a good sell of Egypt. Uh, FDI, you cannot always sit and wait for FDI to come to you. You have to go to FDI. And to go to FDI, you have to have the, the, the right structure and, and the right uh, people to, uh, to, to do that. And then uh, once the, the, uh, the FDI is in the country, you need stability, you need um, uh, obviously transparency, and you need uh, clear rules and regulations. So if, uh, if again, it was said that uh, the government cannot do everything, as a matter of fact, we want the government to do less. Please do less. Uh, at the moment, uh, uh, the less you do, the better it is for everybody. So uh, please make sure that you focus on the role, as Mr. Kojok mentioned, uh, the, the role of uh, being um, a regulator, being um, uh, a facilitator. But let's try and get a little bit out of the command and control environment that has been existing for tens of years. It's like any organization. You go from command and control to uh, high performance organizations, right? Uh, as a country, countries are similar. We want to move our country from being a command and control countries and everybody has to listen and abide by the, the, the rules that come out every day to a more uh, perf high performance country that allows everybody the chance to uh, perform and to, uh, to really give their best in, in the best interest of the country. And by the way, uh, if we go back to the light at the end of the tunnel, we, we are one company that exports more than $200 million out of Egypt every year. As an investor, this is what we offer back to, uh, to, to the economy. Uh, are we happy with that? No, we're not. Because our biggest competitor uh, in Turkey is, um, is, is selling billions at the same time to the same markets where we're selling $200, uh, $200 million. So it's all relative. We have to look uh, um, uh, out, not in. And, uh, and compare and benchmark all the time and re-examine some of um, the statements that we've just repeated for tens of years. For example, Egypt is a low-cost producer. Egypt is not a low-cost producer, generally speaking. Uh, if I take uh, our, um, our industry, for example, the lowest-cost producing country is Algeria, by quite a margin, Algeria. Uh, by quite a margin below Egypt. If we look at 
cost of production in Egypt compared to the Gulf, here is the surprise, almost the same. So uh, we have to re-examine all that. And again, I, uh, it has become a bit of a myth uh, and we have to re-examine all those um, uh, slogans that um, may, may and may not or may not be uh, necessarily true. So all, all these elements uh, are very important if we are to uh, attract FDI, retain FDI and maximize the, the, the value of FDI investments in, in the country. And in a previous uh, session, uh, the moderator was an AC professor, Hany Gnina, and the whole AC professor is smarter than me. He talked about uh, the fact that uh, we are more service than we are into uh, you know, uh, production. And uh, ironically, and I discussed it with the Minister of uh, Finance, we do give export subsidy for goods, but we don't give for services. So we're pushing to be China, but maybe we're more India. Anyways, last but not least, uh, concluding remarks, and we will conclude. So I, I do think Egypt has a golden opportunity given the global environment and the political will to fix some of the structural issues once and for all so we're not sitting on this stage in five years having the same conversation so that's the bright side i think it's, it, there's a fork in the road and there's a way out what i would say is you can't do everything at the same time so prioritizing five sectors based on some variables whether they're you know do these sectors generate foreign currency um, do they for example deliver on social outcomes that are critical such as healthcare and setting these in stone and then setting up that implementation body and that very strong capacity with the best people as Mr. Sam mentioned and having clear KPIs and just de-bottlenecking things as you go along and we've seen how what impact this could have for example based on what happened in the energy sector so the energy sector is a very strong example of an Egypt success story government, private sector, support of international and local organizations. And because of this, in this current environment, for example, from our side, IFC last week, we announced a $1.1 billion investment in the renewable energy sector, as others have at COP27, in the middle of this global volatility. So if you have very strong governance and government commitment and a proven business case, you will continue to attract investments and be resilient. But it's very important to take the energy success story, take another five sectors, and just drive that home for the next five years until Egypt is more resilient in the long term. Then we have, of course, green ammonia and green hydrogen and all what was mentioned, the 8 billion. Thank you all. Thank you very much.